Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Flawless Talk, this time with our new Flawless friend, Mohamed Abdi. We met Mohamed not too long ago at the Mental Health America 2021 Annual Conference, where he was awarded the Media Award for his documentary, Surviving the Moment, a story of how global, national, and local events are connected to our personal mental health. So thanks for joining us, Mohamed. Uh, th- glad, to, glad to be here, man. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, it's always uh, dope to connect with, with new friends. So it's dope. Definitely, man. We're lucky to have you. But, you know, here at Flawless, before we do anything, we like to start with a check-in. So, Mohammed, how are you really doing right now? I'm doing good, brother. Thank you so much for checking in. Uh, I'm doing good. My mental health is good. My physical health is good. Uh, just, uh, you know, I was able to graduate last Saturday um, in at the University of Seattle, Washington. And, uh, you know, that was a very big deal for me and my family, you know, being the, the, the oldest of eight and being the first to graduate. It's uh, it's a big deal for me, my family's lineage, the family history, and uh, I'm just glad to have uh, broken down that uh, that barrier. And uh, hopefully, I can set a new trend, you know, for my younger, you know, brother and my sisters, um, you know, in the coming future. So I'm really excited about that. And um, as of a month ago, I officially announced to uh, throw my hat in the bid for running for Tukwila City Council. So Tukwila is the city that I'm from, and you know. A lot of people are familiar with the city council, or at least I hope they are, but uh, it's a, p- a political position in which you try to, you know, serve and represent your, you know, your local city, your your local area. And so Tukwila is my, you know, you know, home. And uh, I, I hope to, you know, get a seat and serve, you know, this position for four years to try to become an ambassador for change in my community. And uh, yeah, hopefully I yeah, just get some, you know, bills passed and, you know, fight for things like, you know, affordable housing, immigration, education, um, things of that nature, criminal justice system, and, you know, helping folks have better living conditions under COVID and the pandemic and, and, and so on and so forth. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, that's all awesome to hear. First um, first things first, congrats on, gra- on graduating. Myself, Thank I you. am also a first generation college graduate. Um, so I understand how important that is to be the one to really, you know, start a new trend and, and build that momentum for your family. So congratulations on doing that. Um, thank you, buddy. And congrats to you as well. Yeah, yeah thank you as well, deal. man. Thank you. Um, we've already touched on all the amazing things that you're doing uh, in the community. You know, you're, you're an amazing activist doing great work. And we're going to dive more into, you know, your activism and your political career and whatnot. But first, I mean, tell us who Muhammad Abdi is, you know, the person. Like, who who is Muhammad? Yes, yes, great question. Um, so, yeah, Muhammad basically, man, he's a very witty guy. You know, I like to, you know, goof around and, you know, um, just have a good old time. You know, I, I took a personality test not too long ago. I'm about like seventy percent extroverted. So, you know, I'm I'm really big on just like being social. Um, in any gathering, in any place, any space that I'm at. Uh, again, you know, kind of what I said a little earlier, I'm the oldest of eight. I'm Somali, I'm Muslim, and I'm, you know, and I'm black. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I celebrate those intersectionalities very big, you know, in all the spaces that I go. And, you know, they mean a lot to me because again, it's, it's my identity, it's who I am. And uh, I love sports. Uh, I'm, I'm a big Boston Celtics fan. I'm a big Sonics fan. Um, you know, I think sports makes the world a better place. Trey, you would know this as well. You know, right, you, you know, right. you are really dope at football, and, and and I know you love football. Um, hearing your um story a little bit at the conference, and so yeah, sports is really dope. Me, really big sports guy, and uh, yeah, I, and for my again, for my one of my passions, just generally, just helping people. Honestly, it's you know, servanthood. You know, being being a person of service, helping. Any people I can, whether it's the youth, whether it's seniors, the, the senior citizens in our community, uh, helping my East African community, being a role model there and, and, and becoming a leader there. And so, yeah, like, uh, honestly, I just, life is very hectic. Uh, life is complicated, but I just try my best, you know, you know, I, to to count my blessings, um, be a, a servant to others and, you know, hopefully, leave a mark on this legacy so that's just a little bit about who i am and what i'm what i'm about yeah man it's awesome to be able to hear and get to know a little bit about who you are behind the scenes because you know your work speaks for itself 
But, you know, I think it's definitely equally important to get to know Muhammad, you know, in your day to day and who you are every day. Um, but, you know, getting back to your work, as I mentioned earlier, this year at the conference that we met at, you were presented the 2021 Media Award for your documentary, Surviving the Moment. So what does it mean to be recognized at such a high profile conference? Man, it is an honor. It's a blessing, you know, and I give all praise to God, you know, uh, without God, nothing's possible. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's such a, a humbling feeling, you know, to um, have your work recognized, you know, all that work that you put in. When I when I did Surviving the Movement, um, you know, last year, uh, it was during the COVID time, it was during the pandemic. And a lot of us, you know, we didn't know what life was going to look like. It was very you know, complex. It was very, you know, scary times. And I was just finishing my junior year of college. And I was like, you know, what, I didn't want to become stagnant. Uh, and, and I and I got to see some of the, you know, the injustices and, you know, the very cruel and traumatic um, killings that we had in America, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and, and George Floyd. And uh, as, a, as a Black person, as w one of my intersectionalities be being that I'm Black in America, aside from being Somali Muslim, I really thought it was important to try to find a way that I could help impact or have some form of, um, you know, influence, you know, as far as like letting us know, hey, like we, we're going through tough times, but we could overcome, you know, you know, when, when, when we have dark days, the sun comes out, you know, the next morning, you know. Uh, we, we have to have some form of faith, some form of optimism. And so when I was doing the documentary, what I was trying to display was talking about mental health, you know, and which is one of the cool things, how we met you and I, Trey, and, and you know, Janine and, and everybody at the conference. Mental health is such a huge, huge thing in marginalized communities, disenfranchised communities, and all communities of color. We deal with a lot of oppression trauma daily whether it's on our news feeds whether it's what's going on with the world whether it's our upbringing our childhood our homelands and so I wanted to particularly focus on the East African Black experience and talk about how does mental health you know affect us in our daily livings how does it affect us with our relationship with our loved ones our parents mm -hmm. our, our friends our colleagues in the fight for liberation and harmony um, so that's why I titled the surviving the movement because mm -hmm. every day is a survival you know, uh, in this movement, we have to try to survive. You know, some of us, unfortunately, we don't come back home safe, you know what I mean? Or we don't even, you know, anything could happen at any given moment. So I just wanted to really focus on mental health and how we could try to change that stigma, that stereotype that we continuously face and let people know it's okay to not be okay. Seek out help, seek out mentorship, therapy, whatever it is that works for you. And the only way we can succeed in this movement um, for ourselves and our loved ones, if we take care of ourselves and our loved ones, if we hear each other out, if we give ourselves um, uh, to people that are in need. And so that that is why I made the documentary and it was such an honor and blessing to have that work recognized because I could have never predicted a guy from Seattle, Washington, school of Washington would have his work be recognized all the way in Washington, D.C., you know? And real quick, I just have to give a shout out to one of my mentors. His name is Kevin from City Rise in, in Seattle. He was the person who nominated my film uh, without actually me knowing. I, I, I didn't even know what Mental Health America was. Um, but he took he took time out of his own day to uh, put my, uh, to nominate my work because of how much he loved it and how much he felt like, you know, this is something that the world could see. And I shouldn't limit myself just in my own home state or my own hometown. This could be something I could expand, you know, to my horizons, like in America, as you can see, like Mental Health America, and uh, in, in, in just far beyond anything I could have ever comprehended or ever thought of. And so Mental Health America really did that for me. Uh, it was able to allow me to see new people, uh, such as yourself, Trey, and Janine, and, you know, the CEO, uh, and, and, you know, of Mental Health America, and a lot of just great people. And now I'm just inspired as I came back from the conference to do even more work uh, to, to make a change. So, yeah. Wow, that, that's, <laughs> to find out that, you know, you won the media award at one of, you know, if not the top mental health conference. I think they said that their Mental Health America is the oldest mental health nonprofit in America. So this, Wow. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that, that was said at the conference. So wow. to hear that you didn't even know you were nominated for the award and then you ended up winning the award is just phenomenal to hear. 
So um, definitely congratulations to you again for winning the award. Um, but Thank you, documentary, I'm curious to know, when it came to, you know, you spoke to your inspiration and, and why it was important to get this message out, but why did you choose the documentary form as your way of telling the story as opposed to another platform or another avenue to share this story? Yeah, I think that's a great question, brother. Uh, the reason why I decided to do it in a documentary form is I've slowly started to realize how powerful videos are in today's age and uh, in today's social media age and, and just to us Gen Z's and, and just in all, just the, the time that we're living in right now. You know, one of my uh, good friends told me everyone for the most part has a time in their day to watch a quick video. Um, many of us have Instagrams. Many, many of us have uh you know, Snapchat or Twitter or YouTube. And so when I was doing this film, I was like, how, how could I have my, how could I have this documentary have it, have it as uh, work, you know, reach as far as it can. And I felt like if I had done like a podcast style or, 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 or the, you know, that type of, uh, you know, form, it still would have been powerful. Uh, I, I don't, I don't take anything away from that platform. But I wanted to also challenge myself. I've never done anything um, close to, or you know, you know, even yeah, very close to the, you know, documentary form. And so I felt that um, I liked the challenge that it gave me um, because it was something that I had a dream of doing way farther down the line, way after I was done with school. Like I could have never thought doing a short. I mean, it's it's a ten minute film, but it's it, you know, it's it's a documentary slash narration piece, you know. And so. Um, you know, I thought to myself, how can I have my work ha have its farthest reach? I felt like video is a very powerful taste age. Um, it, it just has a, just a strong impact on people. You know what I mean? It, it hits people close to home. Um, it's easy to digest. It's easy to follow through. And uh, when you're hearing people that look like you or that you resonate with or that, you know, you're like, wow, like, you know, that point of view is very powerful. Or, you know, I can relate to that story. Or I can relate to that point of view. It, it strikes differently, you know, to different people. And so um, as as I kind of, when I got my work out there and I let, I let it slowly start to marinate within myself, I said, wow, like, it's actually even more powerful than I thought, you know, especially after hearing like some of the, the reactions and the, the outpouring of love and support. I was like, okay, this is the way to go. You know, sometimes for, for many of us that's young, things are trial and error. We, we learn, you know, a lot of things are just lessons, you know, they're never like failures, but they're lessons. And one of the lessons I've learned was a beautiful lesson. It was just if you put in the time and you, 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 you give it your, your genuine effort and love to your craft and to the work that you're doing, um, you never know how far it could go. You never know how it could be received, how it could impact people. Some people actually emailed me um, and, and messaged me that like they cried watching the film, that they got emotional. You know, and, and um, I just could have never foreseen that. You know, when I when I when I put that you know submit button on YouTube and I and I let it finalize and I upload it to the world, I didn't think I was gonna invoke those type of reactions and invoke those type of emotions. I knew it was gonna be powerful because some of my relatives and you know my closest friends they got slightly emotional because that was because the relationship that they had with me. You know, I feel like they got to self-reflect, like, oh wow, like Muhammad's kind of coming to his own a little bit. You know, he's, you know, he's he's doing something special. But when you see someone that you've never met, um, watching, you know, taking their time of their day to watch your work, work your, to watch your piece, and and they say that, hey, like this really struck me, this really inspired me, this really moved me, this made me emotional, it is one of the most surreal, most humble feelings you could ever have, um, because your work is being loved and being recognized and you truly feel like you're doing something special. So that's why I did it. And it was amazing feeling for sure. That's, you know, definitely amazing. and Awesome to hear. Um, I haven't seen the video yet, but you know, listening to that, I don't see how I can't now go after this after <laughs> and go check it out because, you know, just sure. you as a person over the last week or so, and now hearing you speak about it again, I know that this is going to be a high quality film and I look forward to, you know, looking at it, but um, congratulations again for all your hard work and for winning you, the award. But you know, it's you—you you don't stop there, man. You're really just involved in the community and you know, just putting it seems like all of your time into making the world a better place. And one of those things is with the East African Community Services. Can you just tell us more about you know what you're doing there and the impact that you're making? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yeah, great question. So um, I've been working for East African Community Services. Well, I, I officially had a title uh, from last year, 2020, the communication uh, coordinator. And so basically, you know, I'm heavily involved in working with the youth. And, um, you know, I, I did a podcast called the Refund Podcast on uh, on YouTube. And basically the meaning behind that, it was, you know, not refund, like, okay, we, we need something back, but it's more of, of, of like, we need, you know, to have all the resources allocated back into our communities, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, the the money, the support, the love, the the you know, all that we we need that reinvested in and in, you know, into our communities, especially our communities of color and, and our disenfranchised uh, communities. And so that was a really dope uh, uh, experience. And uh, I, I I shot you know, I was doing my show for about three months, and I had a lot of uh, you know great speakers and and the purpose of the show was to work with the African diaspora and try to bridge that gap and bring people together so I would interview people from Kenya people from you know Guinea people from Ethiopia Oromia um you know so on so forth Somalia um so I I think you know for a short amount of time I did a pretty decent job of trying to bring people in the community that were from all different parts of Africa Mm -hmm. uh I, I just had never seen a show like that I've never seen um you know, outside of like, you know, other big shows like Ellen or Oprah, you know, they have more resources, more, you know, funds and and stuff like that to, you know, one, to further their show for seasons and then also kind of work with any guests that they want to, you know, you know, people from England or whatever the case is, right? But for my show, you know, with ESDS, uh, our particular focus was the African diaspora. You know, we're called East African Community Services, so we were particularly focused on our work with East Africa, but I felt like all of Africa as a whole, you know, we're all one, one continent, one people, and so I wanted to just try to you know, have a spotlight on all the great folks that are doing a lot of great things in the community, whether they're philanthropists, whether they're, uh, you know, psychiatrists, uh, doctors, um, filmmakers, um, teachers, aspiring um, engineers. I just wanted to just give give a platform to my community to just try to speak their truth. And, you know, you never know. Um, kind of like I said earlier, documentaries and, and podcasts and things are media related, even like this, you know, um, IG Live and Zoom and all that. That's the kind of like the way to go right now to try to um, get to our people. And so I was able to get a lot of support and love, you know, in that in that form. And uh, yeah, I, I still kind of do it today. It's on hold for now because I'm working on a documentary as you speak. Um, it's about East African uh, it's, it's about East African businesses thriving during the pandemic and how that's looked because we've had such a crazy surreal year. It's uh, you know, it is you know un. This there's no like there's no other time like today's time you know, um so th- that's why a lot of people say a lot of people say it's unprecedented times right, uh because it's never happened in history and so I wanted to kind of like, you know put a spotlight onto how are East African businesses thriving in you know in the the Greater Washington area, um and how has that impacted them how they've overcome the barriers as we still are today. And even when we started during the, uh, the pandemic and, you know, have some of the spotlights on what are some of the hooks? What are some of the, the call to action? What, what could they, what's a message that they can give to other aspiring business leaders uh, in our community? So that's kind of like some of the things I'm doing right now with East Africa Community Services. Yeah. And that's really important work that you're doing. So um, I love to see that you're doing that, that you're putting that spotlight in that community, a well-deserved you, community. Bro. And, you know, like you said, it's unprecedented times for them to be thriving yeah. in. So that's just, awesome to see but you know despite everything we discuss you still find time in your 24-hour day to you know get politically involved as you said you're running for city council and I know you touched that a little bit earlier but to just revisit that I mean you're fresh out of graduate from college and the first thing that you do is you know you say hey I'm gonna go run for office which not many 24 year olds I think I know more people that I, I definitely know more people that are like, hey, I'm going to take a break right now. I'm going to go travel the world or whatever you may have. it. you're like, no, right out the gate, I'm getting involved and I want to make a difference in my community. So if you just want to, you know, reiterate again or, you know, highlight some more things that you want to do for your community and touch on like why, why now is a great time for you to take this next step. Yeah, thank you, brother. Uh, no, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a, it's a full circle kind of a thing for me because, you know, when I also I was born in Kenya, Nairobi in a refugee camp. Um, that's where my mom, my dad, you know, they they uh, 
they was able to see, you know, uh, see each other and, 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 and kind of get to know each other. It was through the, so the Somali civil war that happened in the early nineties. And so when they migrated to Kenya, you know, they were neighbors and, you know, within a year or so of them knowing each other, that's when I was born, you know, and I always told them that's, you know, that's when, uh, this handsome guy was, was able to come out, you know, the womb, <laughs> but, uh, but after afterwards, you know, my dad went to America first and uh, my mom, we, me and my mom came a year after. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, my upbringing and my childhood, it wasn't easy to get into childhood. It wasn't easy to get in the position I am today, you know. And, um, you know, you know, growing up in America, I had a lot of cultural barriers, a lot of language barriers. And I remember times when I would go to school, I would cry to my mom you know, because I didn't know how to speak it in English. I didn't know how to read a book, you know, when I would, you know, proudly volunteer to try to participate in class, I couldn't even utter a few sentences, you know, and I used to, I used to get a little teased at, or I, you know, I, you know, people, you know, make fun or, or, or laugh at the fact that I didn't know English that well. So as I got older, I started to challenge myself in middle school and in all these little different English language, you know, uh, you know, uh, classes, you know, to try to excel my, my, my English skills. And then as I got older, my leadership still, my leadership skills stemmed from being the eldest. And when that happened, I started to volunteer in a lot of leadership programs. I was the varsity team captain of the basketball team. I was doing uh, work with the city council as a freshman in high school. Um, and then even my, my freshman year of college, they, city council and my community flew us out to DC uh, because of all the work that we were doing for about five years. You know, whether it was lobbying bills, whether it was hope, work with homeless people, whether it was working with senior citizens in the community, they gave us a great opportunity to fly us out to D.C., talk to our senators um, that represent Washington. And when that slowly started to happen, I was like, OK, um, my leadership skills is, is expanding. Um, I'm working with the youth. I'm working with the, with the Muslim community. I'm working with the black community. I'm working with the Somali community. And I already made a, a relationship with city council and I made a relationship with uh, my school board and I made a, a, a relationship with the people that make the biggest decisions in our capital in Washington. And so as I was going on with college and I was, you know, you know how school is, it's very hard, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's very, um, you know, it takes a lot of our time. It takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, you know, you, you, it, it just, I always say this a lot, you know, it's, it's a lot of stress, you know, but, you know, as I, you know, was start, slowly start to finish college and, you know, it, I was going into my senior year, I started thinking about what does post-graduation post -graduation life look like? And a lot of my friends, a lot of people in the community was tell me about how there's post-grad depression and how that's a real thing. And so I was like, I'm not trying to get into that, you know. I already live in a Section 8 house and I'm the oldest of eight kids. I want to I wanna build opportunities, not only for the people in my community, but I want to, you know, help out my mother and you know, I want to help out my father. I want to help out my younger siblings. So to give them a better life. And so, you know, you brought up a key point, you know, I'm 24 years old and I'm going straight into city council. What, what came about that? Well, for, for one, I, I felt like, again, you, you know, you finished college and I, and I just finished college last week. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for our families. It's a big deal for, you know, our, you know, our lineage, our, our, our families, um, past, you know, our ancestors. I always say that we're our ancestors' wildest dreams. I didn't want to necessarily put my foot off the gas, you know. I didn't want to stop my hunger to succeed, to build a better life. And so when this opportunity arose and I and I found out, you know, through my aunts and, and some of the people that's in my circle that this position was open, um, I felt like this was a golden opportunity to, to not really stop you know, doing the work that I am doing, you know, I felt like all the work that I'm doing, it could propel, it can, it could, it, it could succeed, it could, it could be continuous, it doesn't have to be at a halt, it doesn't have to stop, and a lot of people growing up told me that, you know, I'm really good at raising my voice, and, um, and so I didn't want to knock away some of the blessings that God has already given me, you know, being in these certain spaces and having these certain experiences, like I mentioned earlier, and so um, when the time aligned, and, you know, you know, I believe in divine timing. And one of my mentors told me that he's going to step down. He gave me the honor and the blessing to say, hey, you know what? I would love for you to take my position. And so that's how it kind of slowly came about. And I just take a huge honor in that. Um, a lot of the Somali moms and the East African moms and the Black community, the Muslim community, the Hispanic community, they're all supporting me right now. And when I went to the conference, it was really dope just to have you and Janine support and the CEO of Mental Health of America and the and, and the, uh, the new CEO and the former CEO. And so it just lets me know, it reassures me that I am doing good work. It reassures me that 
this could be something special and that I could I can um, help affect change. So that's just a little bit why I made that decision. Yeah, wow. I appreciate you sharing that and being as true and honest and authentic and really vulnerable as you've been, not only just that answer, but throughout the whole, you know, conversation that we've just had. And, you know, I know you're making a lot of people proud by just by just being you, you know what I mean? But we just continue to go, you, like you said, like our answers is wildest dream. Like you are, you know, going to be an inspiration. You already are an inspiration and whatnot. So glad to hear you. you. And a lot of what you said kind of leads me to our final question in terms of, you know, going back to when you were younger and how difficult it was for you to not be like everyone else, you know, to not have the tools like everyone else had to not have English be your first language. And that was probably really hard. You know, I can't imagine what it's like, but I, you know, I can just picture it being a really challenging time, especially being a younger, you know, person having to go through that. And so for me, you know, we have this concept of a flawless world at Flawless, where, uh, you know, for me, I see it as this world of compassion and inclusion and understanding. And, you know, I just feel like that's a world where we're not there yet, but we're, we're, we're slowly but surely through the work that you're doing, the work of Mental Health America, the work of the Flawless Foundation, moving closer and closer to a more flawless world. So what does a flawless world look like to you? Man, that's a great question, brother. Um, and yeah, you know, I think that uh, a flawless future looks like some of the things that you said that flawless, you know, foundation is about, you know, compassion, uh, you know, empathy, uh, I think servanthood, uh, love, support, um, resilience. Um, these are things that we have to um, continue to try to push out for our loved ones, the people that are in our neighborhoods, the people that are in our communities, because it is what's ultimately going to help our world for, to be better uh, than what it is today. And um, there's a lot of things that need to be changed. Some of the things we might we might not possibly be able to see now or maybe in five years mm -hmm. but i believe if we put those seeds and we and we flower them and we nurture them and we water them we can slowly start to see it flourish and i feel like people like you know you and janine and people in the flawless foundation you know with some of the work that i'm doing in my community and some of the work that mental health america is doing um in, you know in dc and in in, in 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 the world as the biggest uh, nonprofit organization on mental health this is what gives us hope. This is what gives us optimism is when you see good people, like-minded others doing their part in their, in their, in their respective communities. Um, I think that's really big. I really think that's really important. I really believe that it's important to not have, you know, we live, we live in a, such an ego driven world where sometimes, you know, a lot of things about me, 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 you know, some things we have to just survive. So we have to look out for our own. Um, and you, you might have to do things, you know, just to, because it's a survival tactic, you know, but I think the more times we could just leave with more empathy and love um, and in servanthood, I think that's when we, we will start to see, um, you know, the, the, the domino effect of, you know, things slowly start to change. People start to come around and, and be like, you know what, some of these things that are in bad influence, some of these things that, you know, we've had to grow up in our environment, you know, we can stay away from that. You know, it's okay to be yourself. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to be courageous. It's okay to be curious. It's okay to uh, expand your horizon um, because that's when we'll truly seek happiness. That's when we'll continue to seek liberation uh, and harmony. And um, I, I know that's done wonders for me uh, because I've never shied away from being myself and it's really gotten me far. And I, I could see that sentiment as well from you, Trey, because, you know, you're very authentic and you're such a, a great person and Janine as well. Um, when you're truly yourself, man, things will just slowly come full circle for you. I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer of that. And so I think that we were all brought into this world to be uh, special. Uh, God has given us unique abilities um, and we just have to do our best to try to hone in those skills, um, practice those skills be in environments that can allow us to flourish those skills and uh yeah we'll, we'll make the world a better place so that's what i believe yeah man and you know just more great wisdom and inspiration from you i mean i just feel like you're full of that um so i'm definitely you know rooting for you i don't think i have a vote in the seattle city council race but yeah. you know you definitely have my backing and my support for all yes, of your sir. future endeavors uh, but you know that's it for me for everyone watching that wants to know more and learn more about Muhammad. We'll have 
more of his information in the description below. But, you know, that's it for me for today. You know, thank you again, Muhammad, for joining us and, you know, keep inspiring the world. Thank you guys so much for having me, Trey, and Flawless Foundation. Everybody continue to be flawless.